we'll, we'll uh, jump into things here. So on the subject of marriage, um, to whatever extent you feel like um, uh, sharing some insights and whatnot on relationships, because I posted a thread in, in uh, your Facebook group um, asking you know, what questions people might have, and I knew that I was going to get way more questions than I could possibly handle, but um, I think there were a couple that, that asked about relationships. Do you have any specific uh, insights, uh, learning experiences, lessons in, you know, in a year of marriage? So many. Like so many. I don't even know how to whittle it down. I, I, we were actually just talking today about writing a book together about relationships and starting to do relationship seminars because it is such an intense nightmare in most people's lives, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I, that, would, that would be a well-received book. I'm sure people would be very uh, interested in, in hearing what you have to say. Do you have any, do you have any specific questions you can remember from people? Um, nobody, nobody got too specific on that, but, uh, well, let's, let's start with, uh, um, because you, one of your, one of your first, uh, podcasts was on the subject of privacy. Still not a resolved issue in our relationship. Okay. Well, that answers the question because I actually did a, uh, um, a video response to that one from India and I, I, um, was somewhat siding more with Sarbdeep on that one, even though I, even though I definitely uh, see where you're coming from and the importance of, of uh, moving towards greater, greater openness. But uh, so, you, so you basically sort of left that one um, unresolved, huh? Well, we haven't left it alone or tried to avoid it. It's more that the issue keeps coming up and we keep um, running into the same impasse in accordance with a lot of the instructions which I've been receiving from, let's say, people that are not embodied, <laughs> my guide specifically, is that what has to happen for two people to find a meaning of minds is that they have to purify their negative reasonings for going into things. So if you remember, um, I don't remember whether it was part of the episode or not, but there are positive, like super positive reasons why, like, I want oneness and openness, right? But there's also shadow reasons, right? And if you look at, at Sarvdeep or your other partner, if you're in a partner or somebody, the same thing goes for their desires. It's like a mixed vibration between things that you want for really good reasons and other things you want for really shadowy reasons. And so for... Hmm? What would the, sh the shadow reasons then be? Like of, of wanting to sort of uh, avoid stuff and just, you know, leave, leave stuff behind within like shadow stuff alright so this is what I mean by that if you look at my desire for complete and utter openness right you have the universal truth that oneness is there and that all forms of authenticity basically are gonna free you and so until the, you get to the point where you're ready to air your dirty laundry you're still in self-rejection right that's the positive aspect super universal aspect the negative aspect, if we look at it, and it's like we can, we're, I'm of course assigning the title negative to it, but if we were to look at this sort of shadow aspect of it, what you can see in my childhood is that I was injured by, ex by the lack of exposure. I was injured by privacy, having been in an abusive situation where, we, you know, the secret was to remain between him and I. Now, if you look at Sarb, and you look at his childhood, Right, he wants privacy for the for some positive reasons, being that there's a simplicity to not involving everybody in every aspect of your life, especially when you get famous. It sounds like the uh, one of the lessons there is of identifying, you know, your your differences and and where you're coming to a head, and then not necessarily expecting to resolve it right there, but just yeah. just the awareness of of what it is. And the intention to resolve it, you know, people people don't change overnight generally. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but that's you know that's the point of relationships to a great extent is is for it to foster over the course of time and and. Uh, you know that actually brings us to a nice point that I've been coming to relative to relationships in general, which is that if we're in a relationship, rather than wanting to agree, we should be focused on understanding each other. So if you and I are in a relationship 
and I'm trying to understand you, and you're trying to understand me, then we will both be understood. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, rather than beating someone over the head with, why don't you do this, and why don't you do that? Yeah, which is what most relationships are crap, because it's really a power struggle. There isn't really that genuine desire to know somebody or to have that level of intimacy. And, and so what we end up with is, I want you to be on my side, and the other person saying, I want you to be on my side. So now we're fighting about sides when we really could be, should be on the same level playing field if we really took each other into account. But I feel like we've, we've done a pendulum swing, of course, because in the beginning when it came to relationships, it was like self-sacrifice was so paramount that we're, and that doesn't work, that we've now swung the pendulum to like this super self-centered type of a mentality about relationships where it's like, well, if you don't agree with what I, what I need and want, then you're done. And so we need to sort of come back towards the center where we're capable of prioritizing ourselves as well as our partners and seeing that those things are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, and you need to, you need to find, find out whether you're actually playing the game competitively or cooperatively. Um, there's a great, I'll just give a very quick little uh, example here. Um, I forget, I might, might have mentioned this in another video or something sometime, but there was this experiment that, that people did with, uh, with children in which they invented this game and there was only one, one piece on the board, like imagine a checkerboard, and whoever got the piece over to the other person's side would get a piece of candy. And each person gets one move. So it's, it's really a trick game because you move it one and then the other person moves it one. So you're just going to move it back and forth if you're playing competitively. But if you, if you figure it out, if you trust each other, then you can just say, okay, we're going to move it over to your side first, and then that person gets a piece of candy, and then they move it over to the other person's side after that, and then you can have all the candy you want. But as long as you're in competitive mode, then you're going to be fighting against each other and nobody's going to get anything. I think that's a serious blessing of being in the particular relationship I'm in right now, is that I'm, I've met my power match. Meeting your power match is a really, really nice thing in life, even though it's uncomfortable as hell, because when you butt heads, no one's going anywhere. <laughs> so, fairly quickly here, just, just thought that I would ask uh, if you have any further assessments on sort of the, um, the state of the world, you know, based on the past year of developments, there's there's a lot of you know crazy stuff going on as usual with um, you know major major developments in the Middle East and uh, the um, Ebola situation and um, as you look at things then would you say that things have improved in any way in the past year or, or um, what are the prospects for Earth in the coming you know decade? I watch more polarizing than anything else, so it's like as it gets worse, it also gets better, and as it gets better, it also gets worse. So you find people on the planet today that are reaching higher and higher levels of consciousness, and great numbers of them, as opposed to previously. And simultaneously, to the paradoxical side, you're watching people slip into conflicts that are really approaching a phase of life which we could say is unparalleled on Earth yet. We're still a match to World War. So I would love to see us pull out of that one, but... <laughs> Bashar gave an interesting analogy in one of his videos. He talked about, like, imagine you're at a train station, and there are all these, these trains, you know, leaving the station. And as they leave the station, going off in different directions, they're relatively close to each other, so assuming that they're going quite slowly at first. And... So if you're on a train and then you realize it's the wrong train, you can still get off that train and hop on another train. But as things continue moving outwards, then it gets to where you're more committed to the track that you've chosen, kind of. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, the way he describes it, at least, then, then you know, that's just going to be accelerating over the, over the, um, you know, the next just few years. Yep. Do you think that, like, five years from now, life as we know it now is still going to be more or less the same, or do you see any kind of a very sharp uh, change? I'm surprised the very sharp change hasn't happened already, frankly. 
I don't see, I don't, well, as far as me looking at the life paths that are a match to Earth right now, I don't see our economy lasting five years, for sure. And when when you just look at that on a logical level, if our if our economy isn't going to last like it is for five years, then life itself is going to change because everything is dependent upon the economy. Yeah, that's that's definitely the uh, um, one of the key issues. Not to mention, you know, obviously the environment and everything. But in terms <laughs> of what what has the ability to uh, majorly impact people's lives in a very quick way, um, I, I continue to watch various videos on the economy, and I'll just throw out there for anyone um, who is who is interest, interested to see you know, some, some information on this. Two guys, uh, um, Greg Hunter and Fabian Calvo, have YouTube channels, and they do um, regular videos interviewing people and then sharing their own insights, and they're like, Fabian Calvo is a business insider, and just one after another, just, just people are saying, like, things are really on the verge, and, you know, the the dollar is going to collapse, and, and uh, you know, people who are who are insiders and top level people who are saying that you know this this can't really go on all that much longer. Exactly. A, a few years, perhaps. But uh, so what I like to tell people, see, and then people, of course, when we tell them that, they start panicking and like, how should I prepare for it? And the reality is, is that there's really not a super stable plan yet. For, for dealing with the world in the state that it could get to pretty quickly. And so what I would tell people is that there are a few things which have always been true, which is really what we should put our stocks in again. And what that is is that um, there's power and strength in numbers. So one of the reasons that I'm so interested in bringing these intentional communities around the world is because people in the single family home unit are not going to do so well during this change. People who actually have a group of, of support and also a group of people who have different skill sets are going to do much better. Also, what I want people to remember, because a lot of us in this country will lose all the money we have, because honestly, like, what are you going to do, bury it in the backyard? <laughs> Maybe some people will say yes, but um, if you don't have a real solid plan and if there's not really a plan that's out there that's super awesome for how to maintain wealth if wealth in its of in and of itself becomes not valuable anymore what you've got to remember is that skill set which is something that nobody can take from you is always valuable so like let's look at a doctor um, a doctor has a skill set they know exactly how to um, help someone heal on a physical level at least and as long as that's the case you can't really take that skill set from them so real stuff, basically, like a, like a skill set or like something that you're good at is always going to have worth. So if you take that from place to place, that's a solid guarantee that you're going to get abundance as a result of that trade. So those are the kinds of things that I, I encourage people to put their real, um, the real weight of their trust in, basically. As well as building community. Yeah. And perhaps getting a garden going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The food thing is definitely going to be a major issue. Like even here, I am in Park City, right? And it's what December, and I like you couldn't grow a pine cone, much less anything else. And in this particular, and that's in the summer. In the winter time, you're not going to grow anything at all. So yeah, people who are in places like this, if the dollar collapses, we're not going to be able to live here. So. Uh... I thought people would be very interested in hearing about your combo experience. <laughs> Best decision ever. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. So um, you didn't do a video on this, right? No. Um, so, so I read about it on your blog. If you'd like to tell people, how did you hear about it? Um, what is it? And is it is it legal? Can, can anyone just go do this? As far as I know, it is legal so far. As far as I know, it is completely legal still because it's not it's not a um, drug that causes, like, what do you call it, psychedelic effects and things like that. It's not a psychoactive drug, really. It's basically frog poison. That's what combo is. It's this frothy poison that comes out of the skin of the monkey tree frog. And when you basically they put these little burn marks into your body and then they put the poison into the burn marks and within about 30 seconds the the venom the frog venom goes in through your body 
Now, I was super skeptical before I went out to do this thing. Um, it was one of those things where when you get into the, the spiritual community, you start hearing the word ayahuasca fly around, yahe, you start hearing about psychedelic mushrooms, and it's sort of in the distance, you know. Combo is one of those things that you hear about happening, but it's in the distance. And so I had not had any real desire to do it, but they say that the frog starts calling you, which is totally true. So they'll just start showing up, and it's like you get that impulse, you know, maybe I should do combo. And so I was real hesitant for about a week when I just kept getting these signs. Everywhere I went, frogs were everywhere, and I, and I just, at the end of it, I was like, that's enough, I'm doing it. What combo is designed to do is to lift what they call panema essentially means like a dark cloud or bad luck or bad karma or like a heaviness. So we, you could see that, that multiple physical ailments could fall into that. Anything that's like an incurable, I can't get past this type of an issue, whether it be mental, emotional, or physical. So the people that just feel like they're just stuck and can't get like out from under this dark cloud of whatever it is are really the best candidate for doing the combo. And... What I watched when I went there just completely blew my mind. And um, I'm very conservative when it comes to spiritual medicines. I'll just tell you that. So the fact that I flew out to do this was very surprising, even to me. Mm -hmm. You were just going on intuition on that. And... Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah. But okay, So basically, when the venom goes in, what it looks like on an energetic level, if we're going to play that game, is that it, it looks almost like a green fire. And it, it starts just winding its way through the lymph system and through the bloodstream, just just like in this avarice way. And it, it'll hit your heart. And that's the, the part. It's basically the heart medicine. It just absorbs your world and combo sucks you into yourself. <clears throat> and it removes your mind, which is, I think, my favorite aspect about this particular medicine. When you're going through it, it's like you can't you couldn't think even if you wanted to. You're a, you're aware, kind of. But you can't, you're not logically thinking. It just pulls you into the heart space so strongly. And of course, it causes you to purge and all of that good stuff. But it's not like the kind of medicine, it's really a healing medicine. It's not one of those medicines that you take to go gain awareness into the rest of the universe. And you're not going to be seeing like elaborate light displays, most likely. Okay, it's, it's more about your mental, emotional um, state of being. Yes. So when when that green fire starts to overtake your body, quite soon after that, this white fire just goes and flares up. So it's like there are two ghosts chasing each other through the whole body. And that's what it looks like. So what it took me a little bit to figure out what exactly that white fire was. What it is is your immune system. So the body's own immune system is this bright, I mean like blindingly fluorescent white light. And it it chases this poison basically and then it burns off the poison but in the process of doing that it turns the human on an energetic level into a human tiki torch on the levels of physical emotional mental all the way through their aura fields you didn't have any your vision was more or less the same you don't you aren't it doesn't distort the outside world in any way it doesn't really super distort it. I did have one vision, but I don't know if that's like super common to other people or if it just happened to me because I usually see things like that. <laughs> you're already sort of having a psychedelic experience. So. Yeah. You, your face feels sort of swollen on combo, and so your vision just sort of... It, it's like your vision does the same thing as it would when you're on having a flu or something like that. You just feel like you're inside yourself in some way, you know? It's not like you don't look over and say, oh, that's a chair. You still know it's a chair, but it's you're not really fully present with the external world anymore. You've been sucked into yourself. So if, if, uh, if anyone seeing this was, was interested in, in having this experience, do you know if, I mean, I'm sure people can, can search around for the term combo, and there was the fellow that you did it with in California, but I, I assume there are there's other, you know, people can find online somehow if they want to do this, or? Yes. It's, it's not super hard to find people who do combo because it's not illegal yet. <laughs> but um, what, what I want to say to people is that it's not a, I don't believe really in doing, unless you're really knowledgeable. I don't really believe in doing these types of medicines unassisted by somebody who's incredibly familiar with the medicine and who can hold space for the medicine. Set and setting is everything when it comes to these spiritual medicines. Yeah, and your it's, own 
and your own intention and, and yes. being, yeah, so. So don't just do it for the sake of doing it. It's not a thrill ride. Really, we got to go into this like it's a serious rite of passage. You want it to be the right place, the right time, the right people, the right circumstance. And we can trust ourselves, of course, to know which ones resonate with us or not. I wanted to touch on the uh, the concept of ascension. How would you how would you define ascension? I mean, may, maybe there's different conceptions of what that means, but what's your take on it? In my particular world, ascension means to no longer live in illusion. So it would be the state of complete awareness. We've called that many things over the years. We've called it enlightenment. We've called it a state of heaven, but realized heaven. You know, instead of heaven you reach when you're dead. <laughs> it's a state of freedom, but it's not an exemption from the highs and lows of life. It's more that you're in a state of awareness to the degree that you're no longer resistant to the highs or lows of life. You're willing to experience everything. And that in and of itself creates an inner peace. Peace, of course, we have to understand is not, it's a, it's a transcendent state. The state of peace transcends opposition. So peace is neither good nor bad. Peace is neither positive nor negative. It transcends all of that. That's what most of us are actually looking for. So kind of a... a your acceptance of what is yes but acceptance has such a is such a weird word because when you say the word acceptance to people it almost causes them to go in the opposite direction of where they need to be going because when we say accept it sort of makes us feel like oh I have to just sort of like swallow this thing I don't want you know so it's almost like you find approval for it approval is a better word I think yeah, you were talking about that in a recent uh, a recent interview, I think. Oh, you you're going to hear me harping on that for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, because it's 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 one of those kind of subtle distinctions. It doesn't it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you don't try to change anything, right? It's it's that you kind of recognize the underlying um, lesson of whatever has transpired has transpired for a reason, yes. as opposed to resisting it. Yes. And uh... subtleties are everything when it comes to trying to um, improve any aspect of your life. I think it's what frustrates me the most about being in the role that I'm in, and also frustrates me in general, just as a person who's embarking on a spiritual path and is never going to stop that. Right? It's frustrating because it's like you're working with so much nuance and these tiny little details, and subtleties make all the difference in the universe. And it's really important, of course, that we make those kinds of distinctions for people because it's very easy when we're making general statements or using general words like acceptance for us to have a concept of that word without paying attention to the subtle reactions that we have to those words. So, And just because of the subtle reaction, we might miss the meaning of something entirely. So you're, you're describing ascension basically as a state of consciousness. Yes. Yes. Um, in what way does or does not that not um, correspond with uh, other dimensions? Any change in consciousness is going to affect your physical life and your ability to perceive the third dimension versus multiple dimensions. And so what you watch when people ascend, essentially, when they gain an awareness that is like I'm speaking of, is that they gain access to all awareness. Awareness cannot be limited to the third dimension. So you start to see the realities of multiple dimensions you start to be able to see the perspective of a source consciousness, which is beyond all of it. And it has a very unexpected effect, which of course bores people because when you, when you want to ascend because you want to get out of the third dimension, which frankly is the reason most people want to ascend, like this is dense crap down here, I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, you're sort of dreaming about the day when you're no longer restricted by gravity and so you can fly around and you're no longer restricted by all of these things and so you can do whatever you want and there's peace on earth and nobody eats each other and um, I'm not gonna lie like there's an aspect of me that really likes the idea of that but when you start to gain like true awareness there's no need to show off the abilities that come with it because you realize the only reason you would be doing that in the first place is to get a kind of you know um, worship that you didn't have, of course, when you were younger. 
And because you see that aspect, it's like you can't really be in an, a place of integrity and do those types of things. Even though you can transcend this dimension, you suddenly see the value of this dimension, and so you actually become more of a liver than you were previously. Instead of of being exempt from life, it's like it's more real and more beautiful to wash the dishes. <laughs> so I find it funny, but the people who who really truly find ascension tend to be some of the most mundane. I mean, even though there's a true presence to them, and definitely when you get around them, you can definitely tell. It's still just like, I mean, they're very chop wood, carry water type of people. They're not the people who are like wowing you with like blowing crap up and <laughs> we're just with their mind and levitation and all of these kinds of things. Yeah, I hear what, I hear what you're saying because it's your state of consciousness becomes such that life is magical and mysterious just, you know, within your, within your being regardless of... Yes. Yes. You see everything that there is about life also, the positive and the negative. So obviously if there is a physical dimension here, if there is war, if there is all of these negative things, then there has to be some kind of intention for it. And once you figure out that intention, you feel less of, a, of, of an urgency to basically put an end to everything that is vibrating at this frequency. One of the most important things in my view is is uh, finding finding true unity within with with all aspects of of oneself. <laughs> and so I. Uh, well, you really shoot for the moon, don't you? Yeah. I'm kidding. That's just what we're all doing here. Most of us just haven't really known it yet, but it still is a seriously tall order. <laughs> Definitely. So, if it, just to give an analogy to it, then. If you have pure white light, and then you fragment it, then you, then you get the rainbow spectrum. Yes. And this rainbow spectrum happens to correspond with our chakra system. And I think, as you will probably agree, then a lot of uh, spiritual paths have a tendency to focus on the, the upper spectrum yes. and the upper self. Yes. But the problem is, you're not going to get white light by just working with the upper chakras and the upper colors. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's spiritual escapism. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Because the the lower the lower self is part of the oneness. Is part of part of who we are. So when you say the lower oneness, what do you mean? That's going to confuse some people. Did I say lower oneness? Lower the lower self. Lower self. Right? Yeah. Right. So, uh, well, the um, you know. Purple is purple because it is vibrating at a uh, faster rate and has a shorter wavelength than red, which is at the bottom of the spectrum. And so, so this this shows, you know, the 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 concept of vibration. Yeah. And uh, and so, you know, the lower self then is the is the lower the lower chakra system. And this is you know the the. Emotions, feelings, desire, passion, intuition, is is part of the lower the lower self. Apparently, we actually have something in our stomach that resembles a brain. I read read something about that recently. You should send that one to me. I haven't read that one yet. I have no idea where I came across that. <laughs> something that somebody posted on Facebook, I think. And uh, and so I, you know, what we're what we're dealing with. On Earth, to a great extent, is is lower lower chakra stuff that people are deeply stuck in. Yep. Is that safe to say? Yes. Yep. <laughs> and so you know you can you can you can be working on your visual you know your creative visualization and and uh, um, you know third eye and and uh, all this upper upper self kind of a stuff. But if you don't deal with the lower the lower self, then you're not. You're not, you're not heading towards true unity. Which is always what bugs people about me. Because, and it's very typical of other people who are like super spiritual um, teachers, basically, is that they focus way too much, according to other people, on stuff that's not fun to know about, you know? Like, I'm looking at my, um, I've got this YouTube channel, right? And when I look at the amount of views I've got on my videos, the number one viewed video is how to activate your third eye. And guess which video matters the least to me? That one. Yeah, 
The stuff that I'm much more concerned with is how do we actually tangibly live here? How do we deal with our, our tribal contracts, which is the very base chakra, that's your relationship to like the, the family you grew up in, your, your tribal safety group, you know? That stuff fascinates the hell out of me because it's what creates the most problems. So, yes, I feel like I'm 100% in our spiritual practice, and actually that's really part of what this real new new wave, basically, of spirituality is, is this practice of embodiment. It's the fact that our spiritual direction is not going to lead us into the stars this time. It's going to lead us like way deeper into our life here on Earth, into our embodied life, and into the real nitty-gritty of our physical, like, carnal natures. So... Yeah. <laughs> and you know when when you look at what's happening in the in the Middle East now obviously oh. you know there's there's major anger issues going on there. Yeah, you want me to tell you what that so I'll tell you what chakra the Middle Eastern issues are corresponding to if you'd like me to tell you. Yep, yeah, absolutely. It's all the sacral chakra. Right now Which one is the sacral? Is that the um first? second. Yeah. So that's, it's vibrating at the frequency of orange. But what that is, is it's your sexual creative energies. Now, of course, let's just, let's just go there. Like, hello, look at the religions there and their relationship to sex. Now, we like to look at sex and creation and be like, okay, well, that's pretty simple. But what if I told you that what's, what your sacral chakra also relates to is your sense of power over other people. So government is sacral chakra. So, so what we have is a humongous power struggle going on in a group of people that are not in a healthy space with their sacral chakras. They're not raised to be in a healthy space with their sacral chakras. And might I add, most of us on Earth are not in a healthy space with our sacral chakras. So when you pit these like huge world powers who are really just like overgrown children who have unhealthy sacral chakras all trying to vie for power, yeah, we can pretty much guarantee what we're going to get. Yeah, and then give them some uh, high-tech weapons and see what happens. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Oh, here, instead of a Nerf gun, let's just give you, you now a nuclear weapon. It's so sad on one level, but on another level, it's like, God, what must the people in other galaxies be thinking? <laughs> so, uh, a while ago, I remember you posting in, in uh, your Facebook group, that you were going to go into the astral planes and uh, investigate the concept of anger. Yes, and this has led me in a major wild goose chase. Okay, so because I don't think you put out a video on that. No, I'm st it's still in the works because it's not like a lot of times what will happen when you go out of this dimension and you go and looking for specific information like that is it's very clear cut. So it's like, well, yeah, okay, I should have probably prioritized this a long time ago because it's very straightforward. And then you come back, you teach it, and it's like, oh, why didn't I realize that before, you know? That's not the case with anger, ironically. Anger is turning out to be a much more complicated thing than I realized, and there are multiple different perspectives within the universe, and so I'm, I'm weighing them and leveraging them out, basically, at this point. Interesting. Well, that's definitely going to be a very fascinating... Uh video or whatever when, whenever you put it out. Well, can I tell you one of the issues? Yeah, great. The higher that you go in into the different dimensions, the more the concept of morality starts to dwindle. So you can't really look at the concept of anger without also looking at the concept of revenge. Now, our idea about revenge obviously depends upon our, our social ideals. And if we're trying to uphold um, a, so, a type of social structure, then revenge does not fit into the social structure well. But in the higher level dimensions, there is no such thing as social structure. And so whatever is good for an individual is good for everyone. So I'm running into a massive disagreement. And it gets this, it gets this extreme, right? Now, a person who has been raised in a group where they've been socialized... That means we're looking to create a common peace, right? So that's the issue with anger, but I'm going to figure out how to convey it or at least rectify the issue so that I can convey it in a nice way. But I haven't done it yet, so that's why you haven't seen it yet. I think of anger as outwardly projected fear. Mm -hmm. Oh, and definitely that's, that's decided, yeah. The, the issue that's not decided is what to do about the anger so much. I mean, I've got some suggestions, but there's also a lot of deliberation going on currently between people who are not embodied about 
about the appropriate course of action, but you're absolutely accurate. I wanted to try to try to tackle the concept of God. <laughs> obviously, obviously a big, uh, big subject. So I'll I'll uh, I'll just as quickly as I can give a very quick little analogy, very very simplistic for the concept of, of who or what God may be, and then you can you know feel free to disagree or agree or expand on this. But imagine that you have a vase, a beautiful vase, and somebody takes a baseball bat and smashes it to pieces, and so we would be like one of those teeny tiny little fragments that, that flew off of that face. Yes, yes. And then what I, what I uh, conceive of as that which we call God would be like a large piece of this vase that was, that was kept intact. Does that, make, does that make any sense? A large piece of the vase? So, so, so the point is that uh, we are every bit as much of the oneness of that vase when it was intact. Mm. There is no timeline. This is a good one. I understand where you're going. So let's expand on this one. There is no basic timeline in the multidimensional reality which exists. So essentially the, the vase which is now shattered still exists in a state of wholeness. That's actually exactly where I wanted to go with this, is, is trying to put together the concepts of oneness and separation. Um, because, you know, here, here I am, an individual person, looking through my eyes, obviously having an experience of being a seemingly separate individual being, as we all are. And yet there's this concept of, of oneness, that, that everything is one um, unified consciousness, simply experiencing itself in different uh, um, different forms. Yes. So, would it be safe to say that the different the different dimensions, as you as you decrease in vibration down into the different dimensions, then that experience of separation gets more pronounced. Yes. So, on some on some level of uh, of reality, then everything is is in its unified state of being. Yes. And can you like can you say like is there a specific number of these different dimensions or? Well, w once you get up past the eleventh dimension, which so we could say the twelfth dimension. Once we get to the twelfth dimension, you can't conceive of there being a separation anymore, because the twelfth dimension contains all separate timelines and all potential timelines for all universes. Where else are you going to go from there? So our capacity to comprehend beyond the twelfth dimension is not there. There's no telling whether we will be able to comprehend beyond the twelfth dimension, though, because we are really in a, a state where each fragment of the vase is trying to come to a place where the vase realizes itself. The vase doesn't actually know what it is until it shatters. So, so even though it, ex it exists somewhere in a state of complete wholeness, it doesn't have awareness about that wholeness yet, which is the whole purpose for life, if you want to know. So if you can answer that, what is the purpose of life? Self-awareness. Yeah. You as an individual are a microcosm of the macrocosm, and the macrocosm we could call God. God wants to know itself, you ought to know yourself. How is God going to know itself? You're going to know yourself. That's how. you got to study the idea of fractals to understand that, because in reality, all beings in the universe, even though they might appear physically different, are actually fractals of the greater universe. We're actually all the same, especially on an energetic level. And so, so it's almost like if you could make something the exact, like the, the, if all those shards, basically, of that particular vase were in the shape of a shard. Oh, no. If all those shards, sorry, that were, were part of the vase were in the shape, were the, were the shape of the vase, basically. <laughs> That's what I mean. So when, when these mini vases basically become aware of their vaseness, the huge vase becomes aware of its vaseness. That is why we are doing this. So I wanted to read uh, one, of the, um, one of the questions, and this kind of goes exactly into what we were just uh, discussing. 
it's a really it's a, actually a paragraph, and it's a really awesome uh, question. So I thought I would read. You may have sort of already answered it anyways, but maybe you'll have uh, some further thoughts on this. But um, I think this is pretty cool just for people to hear. <laughs> All right. So she says. Lately, I'm grappling with bare bones, what is love really questions. From what I've gathered by listening to Teal, my life experience, and talking with guys, love is the preferred feeling state in this universe and the one I prefer. But love is all there is, it's all we are, are not mantras I understand, unless love is the totality of all it is. It seems love is more an acceptance and non resistance state to all it is, which would therefore be more of a perspective of, of what is rather than the totality of all that is. Or maybe once you are consistently in that perspective, you realize love is all there is. My guides have also said there is a desire among races in the universe who have actualized and understand love to find out what is beyond it. But in order to take that leap, so to speak, it's important for humans to actualize it as well. Ooh. I like Teal's perspective on that. Yeah, this is pretty wild, huh? Overall, I know what love feels like, but I have a strong desire to understand it at a mind level, too. I'm also going to do that video, by the way. I'm doing a video of what is love, but I'll talk about it now, and I can just be a bit redundant. Um, love is to take the other as thyself. It is the ultimate um, symptom of oneness. So love, as a force in the universe, is just a symptom, which we can feel and perceive of oneness itself and that is the state of our true essential selves and that's why it feels the way that it feels it's like the purest form of authenticity now the reason that we say things like there is only love is because you have things like love and then you have the lack of things like love it's that kind of concept we keep talking about with the light switch where where like you have light and then you have lack of light there's no such thing as darkness really darkness is just a lack so you have love or you have the lack of love. And so that's why people say things like all there is is love. But obviously, it, when it, it doesn't look that way in a polarized universe. It looks like there's a hell of a lot of other things besides love, obviously, because there's people, you know, having sex with 12-year-old children and selling them into slavery and um, <laughs> people killing each other and all those good things. So. A lot of unlovingness going yeah. on. One thing that she was asking in there is sort of is there like is there something beyond love? Obviously, yeah, because because of the um, inevitably continuing evolution of consciousness. Yes, that and and love obviously like we wouldn't know love existed if if we couldn't feel it. So I was so I was in. Uh, in India this past year, I, I had a pretty epic trip. I spent seven months in Asia. Yeah. And you see Sai Baba uh, images all over. Um, really? So, yeah, yes. I mean, Sai Baba is very highly revealed. The, 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 the um, uh, Shirdi Sai Baba. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so I was, I was, uh, I went on this awesome hike up above Dharamsala, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. And it's also a popular tourist spot and um, went on this awesome trek and then you end up uh, with a spectacular view and there was a little shrine up there and um, inside the shrine were uh, an image of uh, or images of, of four different deities I believe and I forget exactly but I think it was you know Krishna, Shiva, and Vishnu and then Sai Baba so Sai <laughs> Baba was the only one that was an actual person you know or I mean that we you know know of um, and so Sai Baba is very, very highly revered. Uh, so what is your, is your memory of, thi of, of that life as clear to you as your memories of this life? Yes. yes. Wow. Just feels, I remember them with the same kind of clarity that you would remember being 16 or 17. And, uh, and what was... What was kind of your, could you say what your intention of that, of that life was? <laughs> My intention was to find an end to suffering. <laughs> it seems to be like an ongoing trend. I mean, ultimately that's what, you know, all spiritual teachers uh, are trying to do that come to earth. One way or another. 
in that life I did I was able to do a lot more grassroots work. Basically in the in the place that I essentially owned basically people would get dropped off there nonstop so I was doing a lot more on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis with people because my, I mean, and, and, and a lot of that, of course, changes because the modern world changes. But back then, they used to drop off people if you, they couldn't take care of them, and the place to take them is obviously like a temple or some other type of a spiritual or likewise religious type of a location. Because obviously, you can guarantee that people of the cloth <laughs> or lack thereof cloth are going to take care of people who are disenfranchised. So there were a lot of cripples that were dropped off. There were a lot of people with diseases that were dropped off. There were orphans that were dropped off. And most of my job in that life, honestly, if people want to know the true story, was trying to deal with all of that. When Shirdi reincarnated as Sathya, a lot of us pulled out. And now, of course, this is difficult for people to understand because we don't see consciousness like a river, but that's how it is. So you have a, a main river, which is really big, but that river might be comprised of multiple streams of consciousness. So I could, so multiple streams of consciousness can participate in one perspective. So often spiritual teachers are a, a grouping of consciousness. So when a when a when one consciousness or one intention really continues to a next life, meaning this intention has moved from Shirdi Sai Baba to Satya Sai Baba then sometimes only a portion of those soul streams, see how I just did that, a portion will continue, and these ones will not. They'll go into other incarnations. That's what I decided to do. That's why I did not participate in South Sai Baba. There was a, in that particular perspective, there was a major rift that happened, if you want to know the honest truth. Yeah, so what, you mean uh, over, like, the effectiveness that you could have? Or, or... Yes. Okay. The rift was specifically this. There's this thing called a city ability, and it's the it's when you when your consciousness transcends, you now have the capability of doing all these amazing things that we've heard about, like changing water into wine and walking on water and performing miracles. Right now, a portion of us that were part of the Shirdi Sai consciousness agreed that that was about the dumbest thing you could do to someone, because what we started realizing was that every time we performed miracles it actually made people feel less close to this, their own godhood nature. And they've turned you into God. Now they become more powerless. Now if you're a good teacher, how can you justify making other people feel more powerless while putting yourself on a pedestal? So, so what some of us did was, hell no, we're not in alignment with that, we're pulling out because the majority of consciousness, of the consciousness stream participating that went on to Sathya Sai Baba basically thought that that was the best way to show people that they were not limited by the physical dimension, that all things are an illusion, basically. So that was the, the decision which caused me to split off from that particular train of consciousness and to continue into this embodiment and other portions to continue into Sathya Sai Baba. Do you have any, like, are you familiar with, like, have you seen any of his videos or anything, or do you, do you have any? No, you haven't? No. Okay, okay. Um, so you don't have any sense as to whether this guy actually is Jesus or not? No, I do have a sense. Okay. I think that what has happened is exactly what I am describing, where, where there are portions of, uh, people are thinking too literally about reincarnation, perhaps even him. Of course, I haven't talked to him, so I, I don't know whether he's actually thinking this or not. But when we think literally and very, very physically based about reincarnation, we're convinced that this person is a clump of energy and that, that clump continues from life to life, almost like it's wearing a physical body suit. But that's not how consciousness works. And so what you find at this particular time, I'll just be honest, and I'm like, it's ironic because I grew up like so anti-Christian, it was unbelievable. So what I'm about to say is like shocking. We're in the return of Christ, basically, right now. And so Christ consciousness is making an Im immense return onto center stage. And so when that happens, what you notice is that the, the consciousness that was participating in the perspective of Jesus is now incarnated in multiple different people. And so 
Um, and I'm hoping Buddha comes back in the future too. But in this particular time, Jesus is the one making a return. So I don't, I have not watched him myself, but I would not surprise me at all if it was definitely an aspect of that consciousness. And I would imagine that it's a, a massively difficult position to fill looking back at what has happened to your teachings and seeing that this is what has come of it. Yeah. Because Christianity has been, in my mind, probably the single most destructive force on the planet. Yes, it has been, and that's about to change. The Muslim religion is about to destroy everything. And it's going to make the Christian religion look like child's play. Now, while I'm sitting in America and that sounds super bigoted, it's still true about where we're headed and about the consciousness of that particular religion. So, when I get out of body, of course, there's all kinds of murmurings happening about about what type of religious consciousness is the most harmful. Well, it's definitely, you know, definitely manifesting now. I have been staying away from the news, so all I get really is information from my little travels at night. What does that mean, Christ Consciousness? Well, what does that mean? Gosh, it's like, how do you quantify that? It's really this idea that you have to... It's the bringing of love back onto planet Earth, really. So even though I, I talk, tend to talk a lot more in terms of oneness, Christ Consciousness is more about love and what you can do with love. There's a really interesting story that, that A.J. Miller tells in, in the course of that video talking about his life as, as Jesus. And he says he was you know, a teenager or something, and there were, there were like rumblings and murmurings that the Messiah was coming. There was a, there was a feeling that that was happening. And, and, so, um, and he didn't think at that time that he was the Messiah. So he was looking around, like, waiting for the Messiah to come. And when, when, a, when a spiritual teacher would, would show up and talk, then, then he wanted to go see all these guys and see which one might be the Messiah. And he said what he was looking for, he was looking for them to be talking about love. Yes. But then over and over again, he would be disappointed because that wasn't what they were talking about. They were talking about yeah. morality. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing and sad how that basic concept cannot seem to be conveyed. Yes, I know. <laughs> no matter how many people uh, try to. Yeah, the question remains the same, how to lead people to it, because you can't teach these things because, by talking. Our, our words really only serve as a means to lead people into a state of experiencing. So until people experience the true power of love and the immunity of love, then they're never going to understand love. So your job really is not to, to help them to understand, it's to lead them to their own understanding. As for your 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 um, astral travels, is that is that kind of a nightly thing or every single night? Yes, I only ch and I can do it in the middle of the day. I mean, like spontaneously, we could just do it right now if I wanted to. But um, usually, I pick the nighttime because in the daytime, I'm doing so many practical things, like the typical mother. <laughs> So you said that, that um, our dreams are actually astral traveling. Yes, they are. But, there, but there's obviously, there's a distinction between that and another form of astral traveling, right? Or maybe not another form, but a, or perhaps another awareness of it. It's another dimensional aspect of it. And when, we're, when most people are dreaming, they're unaware that they are dreaming. So the difference between astral projection and dreaming is the awareness. Lucid dreaming is the closest you get to bridging the gap between out-of-body travel that's conscious and, and dreaming, which is unconscious, where you're, you're actually out-of-body, your consciousness is interacting with the fifth and sixth dimensional realities, mostly symbolic forms of your own thoughts in your life, your own fears, things like that. But um, when you start to become lucid dreaming, then you wake up to the reality that you can control it. It's literally like a hologram that responds instantaneously to your thoughts. So that gets really fun. But there are way, way higher dimensional realities than that. And consensus realities, much like Earth is a consensus reality. And it just gets, I mean, it's so complicated. It gets so complicated. Anything you could possibly dream up that applies to the same rules that are available to this universe exists in the 
multidimensional aspects of this universe. Of course, there are multiple universes as well. And it makes no point to talk about them whatsoever because they don't even operate by the same laws or rules. To use a, a language, to use this language to convey it is not, is not even possible. By using a word, you've already lost the essence of the other dimensional realities in other universes. So, But like you can look at all kinds of different things out of body. I spend a lot of time surveying human consciousness. It's almost like you can. It's almost like when you get into these other dimensional realities, you um, you have a telescope or a is that not a telescope? No, like a microscope, right? On Earth, that's one of my favorite things to look at. And so you can zoom in on human consciousness. You can zoom in on cetacean consciousness. You can zoom in on insect consciousness. You can zoom out on collective consciousness. You can look at any aspect that you want to. So that, and of course, if you're looking for your answers to questions that you've got, it's about the most perfect thing you could do. It's like an unlimited library. But not all perspectives agree, which is when you get into issues. <laughs> is it sort of always a drag when you come back to back to Earth, or, or? it's a it's a startling shift. It seems to be that the vibration between the fourth and the third dimension is dramatic enough that you can really feel the difference, you know. And so it's it's hard. It used to be harder. I've gotten way more used to it. It's kind of like when you, when you first do a deep sea dive and you feel what it's like to pressurize, it's like really jarring. But after X amount of times of doing it, it becomes a normal sensation. And so you don't react to it with as much violence. But... It's not always a drag, no. And there's really nothing quite as good as, like, tastes or smells or sights in this particular dimension. So well, that's, that's what I was going to ask next, is if, when you get it right on third-dimensional reality, is that, is that <sighs> kind of, like, the best thing? Yeah, that's why everybody wants in here. Because it's the most kind of visceral or something? Or, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. It's like the most embodied, so you get to like, exp it's a multi-sensory experience of love or a multi-sensory experience of comfort, and that's really unparalleled. I mean, it's funny because we like to always glorify the idea of objectivity without realizing just how beautiful subjectivity is. And you've got, really, you've got the opportunity in a third dimension with an extreme level of subjectivity which can just be amazing, you know? And what's super fun, what I find fun, of course, is that when you go to the higher dimensional levels, you can come into different subjective realities, which is honestly how I do a lot of my work with people. What I can do is go up out of my body and then into theirs. So I can actually, and by the way, a lot of non-physical beings can experience life through your perspective. So I can do that. And it's really interesting to see just how drastically different subjective realities just between people are on this planet. You would think the purple is purple to everyone, but it sure as hell isn't. <laughs> how many other of uh, ET races are third dimensional? Uh, almost every one of them. They just, it's an option. That's the difference. For most humans, it's not really an option at this point to be physical or non-physical. Their only access to non-physical stuff is when they're sleeping at night, and then they're not conscious of it. But a lot of extraterrestrial races who have shifted into the sixth and seventh dimensional realities, physicality is a choice they can make. So, like, I'm, they exist most of the time in sixth dimensional reality, but then they can focus themselves into a state where they make love or something like that. And so they can they can step into third dimensional reality at will. Yes. yes. And so they would then appear to us to be another another person. Yeah, many of them would. But but the problem with stepping into a third dimensional consciousness from in a, in an extraterrestrial embodiment is that those embodiments are not going to be compatible with Earth. I think it's super funny that most people don't understand, well, if there are so many aliens in the universe, why wouldn't they immediately show themselves? Now, that's a whole other subject because it has to do with why they wouldn't show themselves when they can. But there's a whole group that can't, literally couldn't even if they wanted to. Like, for example, Arct I'll give you an example. The Arcturian race, right? The Arcturian race has an embodiment, a physical embodiment, which is not compatible with nitrogen 
at all. Now, placing them in an, in an environment where there's a high levels of nitrogen, which there are on this particular planet, is a lot like putting a slug in salt. It would evaporate. Bam. So, like, it's, it's funny because, like, we humans, we can't even go to the depths of the ocean on our own planet. And we're confused about why other extraterrestrial beings wouldn't just be able to, like, eat, breathe, sleep, and poop like we can. So what they do is they, they project themselves forth which they can because from those higher levels of consciousness it becomes very easy to literally project yourself forth in order to become the perspective of of like a life form that's existing so what they do is they project themselves forth there's multiple ways of doing it as a physical human or as whatever being they're trying to interact with so like let's say that a whole lot of issues were happening in the dolphin community um, an extraterrestrial would be most likely to project itself as a dolphin What are crop circles? Are, are, are any of them created by ETs? Yes, it's a mix of things. So what you'll find is that there's a lot, humans are highly symbolic, and a lot of languages are highly symbolic. Now, when you look at symbols, obviously, symbols are the most unanimous language. So what you have is collective human consciousness is actually focusing in such a way now that it is able to create like those those huge symbolic communications. So what is happening essentially in a, in a great many cases is that the collective human consciousness, which is its own thought form, is communicating its desires. But obviously those communications are not going to come in the form of English or Italian or whatever other language because that's not the unanimous language for um, human consciousness. The unanimous language for human consciousness will be things like mathematics and symbols. So when that happens, you'll see these. the Earth actually is responding to human consciousness. And so human consciousness creates a great many of them, but this is the thing. This is where it gets interesting. When that started to happen way back when, the extraterrestrial, a lot of extraterrestrial races were watching that and realizing that is how they communicate. So, so a lot of these crop circles are actually them answering the things that we have created. It's like we're it, it's us us being super subconscious of the fact that we're doing it, but these fields and things are actually our message board to the rest of the universe, and they're using it back with us as well, and with each other. So, so crop circles are not as simple as yes, this is the one being, the one race that's using them, and this is the one purpose for them. It's really like. It's like there are multiple beings all using the same whiteboard, trying to use the same symbols to connect with one another. And sometimes they're using the whiteboard to talk to each, to themselves, like you know, like a, certain extraterrestrials will talk to the other extraterrestrials, and then they'll be trying to use it to talk to us, and we'll be using it to try to talk to them. But we're really muddled about figuring out which is the case. And that's going to be dependent on the specific crop circle. And of course, some of the crop circles are man-made, and that's just... Because people are trying to draw attention, and it's a, a game, I guess. I actually watched a interesting documentary of a guy that kind of went underground with, uh, with crop circle makers, and uh, you know, it's a whole—it's a kind of a whole subculture. And yes. uh, and one interesting thing about it was one of the one of the guys describing his extraterrestrial experiences within. You know, while creating the crop circles and and then seeing alien ships and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wanted to get to sort of a uh, um, sort of a basic a basic conundrum that I think most uh, most people are stuck in. And so I I um, talked about this in another video of mine. And the title of the video was the problem with most human souls. And so I'll give a, a quick little, kind of a silly, silly little analogy, and then get your, get your take on this. I like analogies. That's why. I do too. I, <laughs> I come up with analogies all the time. They kind of, you know, give the give the mind something to visualize that can then expand into a more complicated, you know, understanding of that concept. But um, so so the silly analogy is: imagine a uh, a rubber ball, and this rubber ball has has little rubber spikes that stick out. They're hollow, but are part of the rubber ball. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> Synchronicity, y'all. Yep. So imagine some spikes on that, but this is a hollow rubber ball. Is the idea? 
and, uh, and so this represents our energy projecting outwards to the world. But if that, if that ball deflates, then those spikes collapse inwards and then are then projecting inwards instead of projecting outwards. And so, so the, 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 the concept then there is that basically when, when, you aren't, when you aren't claiming your own space, then your energy collapses inwards instead of projecting, projecting from inwards outwards to the universe. Does that, does that make any sense to you? I'm struggling with that one. <laughs> um, the, the idea is, uh, is a matter of sort of bringing the energy through, through one's being and then, exp and then, and then flowing with it outwards rather than the energy getting uh, um, collapsed in on itself and and thus not flowing because it's kind of it's kind of stuck in your your individual um, self yes so that does that yes I think it's a good analogy okay um, and so what would you then say is the uh, solution to reversing that state of being authenticity <laughs> See, we are in our most, if you want to stick with the analogy, in our most natural state, we are going to project ourselves outwards because that's the whole purpose for coming here and living in the first place. So if that's your whole purpose, then that's the state that's most natural to you. Now, what happens is if you're going to stick with the, that analogy is that these spikes are going outwards, right? If it's met with massive resistance, that means you're not validated in expressing. You are rejected and you are told to suppress that then those, that, that honestly is what causes that implosion to occur. So, obviously, then what it is is that there's some aspect of the self that is unacceptable. That causes the massive, the most massive implosion, and it's what causes the subconscious. So, honestly, coming into your authenticity, where you're no longer hiding the aspects of yourself you think that are unacceptable, that didn't go anywhere, that they're still there, you're more sort of starting to own those things and admit to them. Admitting is the first step. Then it begins to cause the energy to start moving outwards again. But like, if you want to talk authenticity, let's talk honesty. Now, honesty, dishonesty, dishonesty with the self happens most often with our emotions. So you'll see somebody, here's, here's how to implode your ball, right? How to implode your ball is you're sitting down at a dinner and somebody says something that really hurts you, right? But it's not okay to express that for whatever reason. Maybe you're afraid of conflict or maybe it's not okay to get angry or feel upset or whatever. So, so that person says they can feel that you emotionally withdrew and they might say something like, well, what the hell's wrong? And you say, nothing, I'm fine, it's great, it's all right. That is a state of inauthenticity. I'm not being honest with myself or you at this moment. Now, being honest with other people, of course, is a byproduct of being honest with the self. But there's nothing worse than not being honest with yourself. What scares me to death, as it applies to people becoming their embodied, realized self, is when people are unaware of the state they're actually in. So, like, if that same person, I could say that, that thing which I just explained to you in the scenario where I say, no, I'm fine because I'm lying to you. Or I could say, no, I'm really fine because I'm lying to me. That's when you get into serious implosion issues. I have to believe that I'm okay with this. And so even though everything in me is reacting the opposite way, I'm going to deny it. I'm going to suppress it. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to tell you you're wrong. One step in, in greater awareness in that department could be that... Even if in that particular scenario you don't, you aren't honest with the other person, mm -hmm. that you at least become more aware and honest yes. with yourself. Hell yes. Yeah. And I'm all for steps. Steps, steps. steps are good. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually that's actually a good uh, um, sort of compromise or whatever that that uh, we kind of inevitably, you know, our our human societies are still stuck where they're at and. And you're likely to, you know, pile a whole lot of hurt on yourself trying to be radically honest, you know, with your family or whatever. <laughs> um, but it, but at least coming to greater honesty with yourself of, of how you're really feeling. Yes, and then, and of course that that statement will change the more that somebody begins to really love and prioritize themselves. 
what you'll find is the more that people start to love and prioritize themselves, the more that their decisions start to change. So at one phase in our development of self-love, it's really profoundly unloving of us to, to not admit things to other people and not be radically honest to other people. We might find that in our progression, it gets to the point where we have transcended all of that and there's no need. So we get to decide based on where we are at currently, what is like the most self-loving thing for us to do. And you're accurate that the most self-loving thing for some people to do in that particular circumstance is to be honest with the self and not others. In a way, it's, it's like, it's kind of a crazy concept that, that, that true honesty is not is not just the way it is. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing that that's, that's the way that it is in upper, you know. Yes, yes, but I mean, this is what I like to say about, about polyamory, because everyone asks about polyamory, and my answer is yes, polyamory is absolutely the answer for our race, it's where we're headed. But the reality is that the majority of us cannot remove our self-worth from our partners, and until that's the case, polyamory is about the worst thing you could do for yourself. <laughs> so, so we're in one of those sort of steps, you know. And honesty, we're in that step with honesty. <laughs> I mean, I'm not at a place right now, and, and this I'll just give you an example. I'm not in a place right now with my career where I could walk up and tell some of the people who are like in the publishing business exactly what I think without getting fired or whatever else from projects and and stuff like that. But in actually in our future, when you take a look at the future life path potentials and when you look at other races that are already in alignment with that, you would be perfectly fine saying your piece about something and the other person would not make it mean what it means right now. Right? So like, you know, the, the person expressing to their boss their dissatisfaction wouldn't make the boss want to fire them because it's not an assault on the boss. Yeah, because there's too much defensiveness and yeah. And uh, people take things personally, and yes, yes, yeah. I think you know that's that's uh, one of the advantages, like to having a YouTube channel and and the comments that you get. <laughs> uh, you know, have have really uh, uh, for myself, criticism really just you know rolls off my back at this point because people have slung everything at me that you know. Well, you must tell me how you do it sometime, because the honest truth for me is that regardless of how much I've been getting and have gotten over the years, it still doesn't like, I mean, it's actually, it is decreasing, you're correct. It's decreasing, because it's, it's, I've heard it all, but it still doesn't like, the sting still stings. Maybe the last thing here was, uh, I'm curious about to what extent our, you know, the person that we are in this life is a representation of our, our soul, as it were. And because there's, you know, there's kind of the, like, spiritual catchphrase of, of uh, that, it's all, that it's all just kind of a movie that we're, we're stepping <laughs> into and playing our parts. Yes. yes. Um, but is that, is, that, is that truly accurate? Yes, but there's a but but we, there's this idea that these parts are sort of set up as separate beings without us being there. But the reality is, we're like an art piece that our soul created. So you can't separate the human from from the soul any more than you can separate a painting from the painter. It's an expression of the painter. It very much reflects the soul. Okay, so it is. Yeah, so it isn't. It isn't if it's all just an act and it's all. A, uh... No, hell no. Well, something much more exquisite and beautiful than that. But, but I mean, to ask that question would be the same as to ask, like, what portion of Frida's paintings were Frida? It's confusing. Yeah. No, I like I like that a lot better. Just because I didn't I didn't I don't resonate with the the idea that it's like that it's all just an act. I think that a lot of our um, analogies are useful. It's like anything in the spiritual field can be used for your benefit or for your detriment, I've noticed. So we like to take these analogies and then run with them and apply them to everything when it's very much so about the circumstance that that analogy is put forth for the purpose of. So we put forth analogies like you're walking into a movie theater to help people understand that like walking out of the movie theater with death is a really easy transition. 
that's when it's a good idea to use that that analogy. When we lose it is when we we use that analogy in a, accordance with self worth or whatever stuff like that. And now we start to think, oh my gosh, it's absolutely worth it. like it's meaningless. It's just a stupid game that like it's already been set up. I don't even have a choice, you know. That's a good thing that we need to say to everybody. Everybody out there, okay? Every single analogy, every single thing that's said spiritually can be used in context appropriately or out of context to do a lot of damage to yourself. So it, is there um, is there a, a energetic gender in some context to, to the soul? No. Uh, so there, so there isn't a, even like a, like a tendency in one direction or the other? If there's a tendency, it's because a specific soul stream has the desire to experience that particular gender more because of whatever it, that is giving rise to. Obviously, being in the position of being masculine is going to give rise to totally different experiences and a very certain consistency of experiences. It's sort of like some people prefer, prefer salty dishes and other people prefer sugary dishes. And it's all based on what we think our highest expansion is going to come from. But it just so happens that even though there's absolutely no gender, basically, when there was first polarity invented within the universe, there are a great many, um, a, a portion of consciousness, I should say, that decided to go with the direction of female and a certain portion that decided to go in the direction of male. So I should say it depends how far back you trace the soul. Like I have experienced more, more um, embodiments as a man. So when you're around me, you might feel that the essence itself is more masculine. But the reason for that is just because I have experienced that so much and every life is a culmination of the previous lives that I would, I would vibrate at a frequency that is more masculine and feminine at this point. But then as you, as you, as you move up in, in the higher dimensions and that just... Yeah, it's just <laughs> completely just... <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> Do you like the sound effect? That's what it sounds like too. No. <laughs> I mean, there's always more to discuss, obviously, but uh, I'm guessing you probably got to get on with your day. And yeah, whoa, it's two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been an awesome uh, discussion for sure. I think people are gonna get a lot out of this. And uh, so, is your 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 uh, book is still in the works? Yeah, it's slated to come out in May. Oh, great! Of next year. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to come out in May. Yeah, excellent. I've got some other fun stuff coming out in the meantime, too. What's that? Well, I don't know yet. I'm in the middle of writing another book, and I, I, don't, I haven't decided what I'm going to do with that particular book yet. I've also, you'll be the first to know this, I've also created a tarot card deck. So I'm looking for a publisher for that. Excellent. And, uh, and then you're... Do you think that you'll be moving in the next year, or just not sure? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stay right. in the certainty. What do you know? Yeah. Well, you got a nice, cozy little house there to spend the winter in. So. Yes, I do. All right. Well, thank you very much, Teal. This was really awesome. Thank you. I'll see you later. Thank you for your time, and uh, talk to you again. Hey, okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Namaste and aloha. Aloha.